Good morning this day, and welcome in the name of our Lord. Welcome to this service of worship. It's good to see you today and to be together. I think the word of welcome is such a critical part of our worship, for indeed, uh, when you look around and see each other, you're looking at people that God loves, that Jesus has come into the world to save. And so all of us, each of you, are most welcome here, and we are delighted to be able to issue that welcome on behalf of Jesus Christ and in the assurance of his love. A couple of announcements, uh, as always. Uh, you'll notice inserted in the bulletin again this week is a sheet of paper that gives you an opportunity to let us know how you might help with some of the worship services uh, that we have. Uh, there are a variety of needs, as you see on that piece of paper. We had 23 responses, which is pretty doggone good, but we're going for 30. So uh, uh, let us know if there are things that you would be willing to do to help us with the variety of things that go together to make our worship rich and meaningful. Also note that uh, following the service today, there is a potato bar in the fellowship hall, a potato bar to help us raise money for our youth ministry, especially as it relates to trips uh, to Montreat the summer trip to Montreat that our children, uh, our teenagers often take, uh, is critical to their faith development, and they look back on it uh, and look forward to it. And so we like, as a congregation, we like to be a part of that ministry. That's immediately following worship today in the Fellowship Hall. We're in the midst of Lent, which is uh, intended to be a penitential time, a time when we think about our own sinfulness and neediness, and yet there's also a pervasive joy. There's a wonder that comes in knowing that we are loved, that this season of the year comes to an end with Easter and with resurrection and with the power of that renewal of life. And so in the assurance of that, even as we confess our needs, in the assurance of resurrection and new life, let us worship God.
And let us rise in spirit and in body and be called to worship. Listen for the word of God. We seek God's wisdom. Enter God's house with thanksgiving and praise. Join us as that body as we worship God. God's commandments are a mirror showing us our faults. They are a fence to keep us away from evil. The commandments are a map to guide us. Accepting that we have not always kept God's commandments, let us confess our sins now using the prayer printed in the order of worship. Lord, it is only right that you would be angry with us. You have given us everything, but we have not been grateful. You have offered yourself by your promises through your commandments in the teaching of the prophets 
and the Word made flesh. Too often we have ignored these gifts. Further, we have been ignorant of your greatest gift, your self-sacrifice on the cross, and your Easter resurrection. Forgive us for finding the cross to be foolish and for believing that the grave is final. Forgive us for our confusions about the justice of your anger. Guide us to repentance and to new commitments. Amen. When we ignore the commandments of our God, we do so at our own peril. And yet, God is a deliverer and a rescuer and the one who forgives. We live and commit sin. We do so to our own peril. But God rescues and delivers us. Friends, again this day, hear and believe that good news that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. And as forgiven souls, let us greet one another with a word of peace. Indeed, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Recording blessings. Lord, we will listen for the comfort you offer us, for your law revives the soul and makes us wise and brings us light and joy forever. Open our minds and hearts, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is what God said, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in Egypt. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. 
Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land your God is giving you. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. To love our neighbors as ourselves, and to love your law, not simply as a list of rules, but as a picture of life lived in harmony with you and with another, life as it was meant to be lived. We live with a force that excites us and thrills us and gives us courage and strengthens us for the living of these days. That force is our faith, and we read about that in the second chapter of John. Listen to the Word of God, and let us stand together. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the table he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated around the tables. 
and making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His tables, his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, What temple, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And this is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, in this text, Jesus is is cleaning house. Uh, No, Jesus is really remodeling the whole place. Jesus is remodeling the Jerusalem temple. And why shouldn't he? Jesus can do whatever Jesus wants to with the house of the Lord because it's his house. The first step in a good, thoroughgoing renovation is demolition, tearing out the old. Jesus is ready. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So it's personal with Jesus. The gospel says that he was talking about the temple of his body. When the Jerusalem temple is mentioned in the Old Testament, the temple is never, never called my father's house. But Jesus calls it that. Jesus has a different take. Jesus is laying claim to the place. Stop making my father's house house, a marketplace, he says. So Jesus is assuming a kind of responsibility for the temple that no one has ever claimed before. It's his father's house, which means it's also his house. When Jesus cleanses the temple, he's simply putting his own house in order. Nowadays, there are a lot of television shows which focus on home improvement, and they have funny names like Fixer Upper, and This Old House, and Flip or Flop. And these shows show innovative homeowners exceeding their renovations budget with the help of some clever contractor whose amazing ideas can turn a dump into a diamond. They are so popular, I think, because they give us a little bit of hope. Millions of us watch those shows, mostly on HGTV. We watch those shows and we imagine, hey, you know, maybe I could do something like that in, in my house. Maybe I could be that bold about repair and renovation. Maybe I don't have to live like this anymore with all the peeling paint and the water stain on the ceiling and the old, old wall-to-wall carpet that's outlived its usefulness. Maybe, maybe there's something better for me. Well...
of sexual harassment. Kroger's, Meyer stores, and Walmart, and L.L. Bean, and Dick's Sporting Goods have tried to put stricter, stricter regulations on gun sales, stricter even than the federal government requires. The Times piece calls this a powerful upwelling of decency. Voters have responded to dangerous white supremacists of the so-called alt-right movement by voting them out of office. The students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School have pulled themselves together in the week after that tragic shooting. In that week, they've pulled themselves together so that they might go to Washington and speak to their legislators about gun control. And what they said seemed to make complete sense to the rest of us who were so stunned and confused. An upwelling of decency happens when enough people see that a remodel is necessary. Remember the words of that church mother in Montgomery, Alabama. Martin Luther King asked her if she was tired of walking during the